Hi everyone, and welcome to this session on Secure by Design. Secure by Design was born out of some kind of friction that we saw in our life as developers, where on one hand side, we thought that security is important. Of course it's important. It's about keeping people and, and things secure. And we should care about it a lot. And on the other hand, we saw that security often got to play the second-hand fiddle in development work. And it was also, we often saw it and, and also experienced it as, as developer to being a, a distraction from the, the real productive work we wanted to do. And out of that friction, we started to think about, aren't there ways that security could be like a more natural part of development? And out of that, we came to look on designs that we spontaneously did and, and saying that these are interesting because these have actual security benefits. And this is what I'd like to share with you on the session today. So uh, quickly about me, Dan Berg Johnson. I'm a developer at, at professional. Um, do development everything. I've been working from financial system, media, uh, been working in various domains, various uh, technical platforms, both Java and on .NET mainly. Uh, and uh, often take roles such as architect. Sometimes I'm the agile guy. I've got also an interest in, in, in methodology. Um, Developer, lead developer, tech lead, stuff like that. Uh, so basically, know why I've got me. Uh, I'm working with a company named Omega Point, a Swedish consultancy uh, controlled by the employees. Uh, and uh, we'll work in the crossroad between development and security. So secure digital transformation, also some cybersecurity stuff. I'm also uh, one of the authors of the book Secure by Design which came out about a year ago, uh, together with my two co-authors, Daniel Dorgan and Daniel Savano. And that book is based on our develop experience as developers trying to find uh, design as a way to add security. So the key takeaways from this, if you should fall asleep or just miss what I was talking about is that, a lot of secure vulnerabilities are actually just bugs. It's misbehaving code. And these can be prevented by software design. That's what we do. We use design to prevent bugs. So the ambition of secure by design is to collect designs that prevent bugs or other stuff that manifest themselves as security vulnerabilities. Of course, there are lots of other interesting designs, but we're focusing on collecting those that actually has a security benefit as a side effect. We're going to drive this discussion a little bit from the perspective of uh, the security concerns of confidentiality, integrity, availability, and traceability, the CIA triad. And as this is a rather short session, we will not be able to cover secure by design to any extensive depth at all, but we'd like to give you a little bit of a tidbit of four different ways where designs can make a difference for security, even if those designs not were originally conceived for security purposes, but for other purposes. So what's the state of digital security today? Well, it's pretty bad. I mean, we still do not take security really seriously. Uh, we got the we got big breakthroughs like Equifax re revealing lots of personal data. We got uh, a lot of things that security is taken for granted, where it actually takes a conscious effort. Security is seen as a feature, not as a concern. You add some security features and then you're basically done. No, you're not. Uh, we got 90 days is the mean time for patching when a Linux version has got a vulnerability and there's an available patch. It actually takes 90 days for the mean time of those being patched. So it's not a 
someone else's problem and security is hard. So this is the situation we want to address. When you talk about security, you often focus on that you have concerns that you have to be met. Most people think about security as something that you should keep secrets, confidentiality, encryption, stuff like that. But that's the only one part. If we also got integrity, that things that can be published but are not meant to be changed. For example, a news magazine, they really want what is written on their website not to be confidential. It's uh, meant to be out in the public, but it should not be changed by someone else. So integrity are sometimes an important security attribute. Also, availability is an important security attribute. If you were trying to call the emergency number not, uh, and they're not answering, then it's a security problem. Also, on this CIA triad, often it's added some kind of who show, changed what, some kind of traceability. So this is what we're going to build on. But first, I mentioned that what we say is that security problems are often misbehaving code. And if we look at the kind of bugs that there's space of bugs that can occur, look at the dots in this picture. Some of them have got security implications. Let's mark them triangles. And we as developers know how to address bugs. We'll avoid bugs by using designs dependency control, inversion of dependency control, for example, or list of uh, substitution principle or uh, domain primitives or whatever. And all those designs has got the attempt to, to um, eliminate or, or reduce the risk, mitigate some part of the realm of possible bugs. Some of these bugs might be of security. Uh, significance. So here I've got a few uh, designs. One, two, three of them actually cover a triangle, which means that we try to collect those designs as interesting. There's also a fourth one, the big one in the middle, that covers a lot of bugs. It will reduce a lot of bugs, but it's not, none of those are security related. So it's an interesting design, but we leave that aside because it doesn't have a direct security benefit. Now, this is really vague, but I want to like convey the idea of that we're trying to collect the different uh, designs that have security effects. And the designs we have collected are those that we have come across during our professional lives, three authors of us. And more formal de definitions, of course, the a mindset and strategy for creating secure software by, software by focus on good design which is the definition out of the book. So the patterns that we're going to look at are uh, domain primitives, uh, detecting sensitive data leakage, traceability avail and availability, centralized logging for traceability, and the three R's of enterprise security. And please buckle up, because it's going to be a pretty fast ride through this. So integrity to start with. Here got my esteemed colleague, Daniel Jogan, who's been out shopping books, and he had said it's secure by design, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and then he thought that um, it was a little bit too expensive, so he ordered minus one Hamlet, thus giving him a, a discount on the total. And when he opened the box, when it uh, arrived at his home, there were three books. Of course, Hamlet was there as well, because the people in the at the warehouse do not know how to add minus one book, so they added one book. So this is a business integrity problem. It's a security problem because someone has walked into your web shop and walked away with money or money's worth without paying for it properly. So how can we avoid this? Well, the analysis that when I enter minus one Hamlet, it's an integer, it's in the math context. And this is translated to an order line in a web shop context with an ISBN and minus one as the quantity. However, is quantity real an integer? Of course it is. No, it's not. Let's remember that an integer, it's an interesting uh, mathematical uh, 
uh, uh, construct, which is an abelian group, which also says that's an identity element, which is zero. Then needs to be an inverse for 42, that's a minus 42. And when we look closer, this does not hold for quantities because a quantity can't be negative. It's not closed under addition because if you add 52 with 67, you end up with something that is not a quantity in this web context because they cannot handle more than 99. So it's actually not a quantity. Uh, quant is not an integer. Another popular modeling choice is, of course, to consider it a string. Okay, what characters are legal? What operations are allowed? Does this make sense? And no, it does not. So, what is quantity? If it's not a, a string, it's not an integer. Let's just briefly talk about another example. If you look at hotel room and room numbers, it's got the same thing. It looks like an integer, but it's really not. It looks like a quantity, uh, sorry, a, a string, but it's really not. But if you talk to people in the hotel domain, the hospitality domain, there's no confusion about what a, a room number is. It's immediately understood, but the people at the bar at the check-in desk, by for replenishment, by uh, housekeeping. So explaining it as, a hotel room number is an integer. It's actually to explain something simple, a native with something that is foreign and strange and convoluted. So what is a, a room number? Well, it is a room number. It's native to the domain. It's immediately understood by anyone in the domain. And this is what we're going to use as our foundation when we write code. So going back to the quantity. A domain or domain primitives. The things that are consist of building blocks that are native to your domain, they're valid in the current context. So a quantity, not in general, but a quantity in the context of this web shop. It's limited to one to 99. And we can only talk about them if they are valid. We cannot talk about a quantity of zero or minus two or minus one or 867 because those are not sensible quantities. Well, I like the philosophical part of it, but I think sometimes it's easier to look at it as code. So when it comes to the end of the day, there's code. And quantity is just a class, which is basically in this kind of wrapped up int. Yes, we use an integer on the inside to do representation. But the type we create that we say is that quantity is actually a concept of its own. Note also that in the constructor, we have the limitation that it cannot be higher than 99 and it cannot be lower than one, which means that have we been able to construct an object like this in our code? Well, in that case, it is a legal quantity. Now we have immediately pushed the validation to an intricate part of the code. And of course, there are lots of ramifications of this that you have validation in one place. You cannot accidentally skip validation. Uh, you'll get a richer uh, vocabulary for the for code to talk about quantities. It's not sending about long parameter lists with int, 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 string, string, int, string, int. Instead, it's sending around long parameter lists with quantity, shipping address, postal code, etc., etc. So the benefit here is, of course, that how do we solve the integrity problem? Well, if you try to construct a um, valid quantity, minus one, this will be immediately be right, rejected by definition because only valid quantities are accepted into the domain where you add an order line. You cannot construct an order line with a negative quantity because you can't construct a negative quantity. Quantities are, in essence, valid, uh, valid values. So, of course, this is not a new idea. 
domain primitives act as building block and which has been practiced in, in uh, computer science since the dawn of the of it uh, Abelson Sussman uh, talked about a stack of languages in their structure and interpretation of computer programs and Guy Steele had an excellent presentation at Uppsala uh, 890 something uh, about growing language okay so let's move to the next part I promised a tidbit of each uh, of these. So confidentiality, things that are secret should stay secret. Here we've got an example of a table reservation which contains no sensible uh, sensitive data. Uh, two people at the grill at six o'clock. However, after a while, the domain will evolve and include some kind of, of uh, loyalty program. And at that point of time, there's suddenly personal information in here. And look now what happened. The logger now suddenly contains uh, sensitive data that may leak. And this is not a good thing. Think JDPR. So how can we address this by design? Well. We will have to model sensitive data as sensitive. So as if something is sensitive, then it is a design concern that we should take into account when modeling it. Not just adding slapping security at, uh, on top of it at the end, but actually make that concern something that's part of our modeling and thus part of our coding. One thing to solve this is to use a read once pattern. In this way, we can have, for example, a personal uh, identity number or a credit card number, something that should not be leaked into a log, for example. We can construct that as a read once object, which will, well, if you look at this a little bit closer, you see in the value, it will self-destruct when it's read once. So if someone accidentally read this and put it on the log, then at the later occasion which is going to be used for real it will throw an um, exception and that way we can detect that uh, that leakage and patch the code okay so we're getting uh halfway through our list of the say i tried and let's look at the third or fourth, if you count it, Psi IAT uh, concern, the concern of traceability. Well, we all uh, know that traceability has got some interesting problems. The problem with log tampering, uh, accessibility of log data, uh, the, the persistence of log data when an instance shut down, for example. So let's see what we can if the what has happened that actually addressed this well we have the evolution of logging from monolithic logging where we had a monolithic system to distributed logging when we had distributed systems like clusters but also um, microservice architectures where a, a, a call actually travels from one system to another and you do not know in which log this shows up and the evolution of logging has been from that to then start treating logging as a service, which we see driven in, for example, the 12 factor manifesto. And that is not driven by security, it's driven by other design ideas. So now we've got logging as a service. Let's just see what, what did this solve as a security problem? Well, we have got protection against log tampering, naturally, because the logs are somewhere else. We've got access management. We can access management, have access management in one place. Uh, the logger persisted and we have simplified log correlation. So a lot of things are solved. Uh, so what have we got that remains? Well, we still have the problem of second order injection attacks. Now, a second order injection attack is where you're not attacking the system as such, but you're attacking the system with poisonous data so that it will add that poisonous data to the log. 
Then at a later occasion, the logging tool will look at the logs and there will be some kind of vulnerability exploited. And of course, the logging tool is run by the system administrator with high privileges inside the DMZ, so pff, they got access to everything. So how can we avoid that poisonous log? Well, one way of doing is to, to have domain-oriented APIs for your logging. So instead of having this classical that you compile a lot of strings and put them into logging, then wrap up your logging inside something that has got a domain-oriented API. Reservation completed. Send in the reservation. On the inside, your domain-oriented log API will do the appropriate things and send those logs, for example, to different uh, uh, syncs. Audit log, error log, metrics log, and those logs might actually have different cadences, different retention policies, etc. So, design trick that actually had a lot of security. Okay, we have the fourth. Let's have a look at availability. Well, you know, available all the nines, uh, nine nines availability. Uh, this has been become more increasingly important the latter year uh, with the advent of advanced persistent threats. Well, which is something that all, well, serious big time actors now need to take into account. They're advanced, they're using lots of several vulnerabilities, they're persistent, they've worked over a long time, and they threat uh, significant data loss or damage. For example, the Belgacom attack, which infected uh, the Belgium telecom network. Who would like to know whoever called whom in Brussels? I don't understand. Well, it turns out the Brits wanted it, seems like. And so let's see. Well, the interesting thing that they, these often exploit that things seldom change, that we've got stale service, credential, IP addresses, etc. And there are a lot of reasons for stale environments. One we can affect the application design. So looking at a few design patterns from cloud design, you realize that they are, have also have security benefits. So external configuration, immutable builds, stateless services, etc., enables us to do rotate, repave, and repair. I will not dive into how to externalize configuration or how to make service discovery. You probably know those things already. But what they enable you to do is to rotate, to replace an instance in your cluster very fast. For example, why not do it every hour instead of just when scaling up and scaling down? Do it on a regular basis. You push out new instances and decommission them on a regular basis, like every hour. Then you can have the three R's of enterprise security, rotate, repair, and repair. And kudos to Justin Smith who coined this terminology. When you repave, you replace the instances on a regular basis, like every hour. For advanced persistence threats, this means that if they have planted a backdoor in an instance, it is gone within an hour. A rotation of secrets means that you can rotate, for example, uh, access tokens every two minutes, meaning that if they have sniffed it, they cannot use it. You can rotate your production database password every hour instead of doing it like never. And you can patch the service because you'd not need to patch the instances because you're rolling out new instances all the time, meaning you patch the recipe and then all these are automatically rolled out. Which for an advanced persistent threat actor makes the life a nightmare. It's like trying to balance through one of those like, you know, playgrounds with a lot of balls and they just slip under your feet instead of they making getting a foothold. So, let, looking back, we have looked at very quickly a few ways where you can use designs 
that come from other sources, from cloud, uh, from uh, domain-driven sign, uh, from, uh, from logging practices. And when you use them, you actually get it, they feel natural to you, but they actually give you a security side benefit, which is the takeaway of the secure by design. A lot of secure developments are due to bugs, misbehaving code that can be prevented by using design. And thus, security becomes a more natural thing to do. You don't have to think about security all the time. You think about good designs, and then you get security benefits as a side benefit, basically, a side effect. And secure by design is actually uh, just a methodology to try to collect those kinds of designs that prevent security bugs. And which brings us to the end of this presentation. I hope you have gained some insight in what we have been trying to do over years uh, to make development a little bit secure, more secure place and to bridge that unfortunate gap between security and development. Thanks a lot for your attention.